Thanks for inviting me. Uh, um, I'll um, continue with the paleo um, world. So um, we'll. Uh, um, so I, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm pretty well set up by Johan's uh, previous talk. Um, I don't see any presentation on the screen. It'll be up in just a second. Okay. It was just uh, re-syncing from the speaker ready room. So um, what I'll be focusing here on a very specific time period. Um, now the, the um, uh, glacial interglacial variability in atmospheric CO2 has been um, an enigma for uh, many decades and we still don't understand it. Um, so may maybe uh, instead of focusing on the whole uh, change, uh, uh, looking at it in, in parts and in different intervals may be uh, a, a, more, a better way to, to understand it. And so here now I'm focusing only on the early deglacial CO2 rise, so the initial rise from the LGM last glacial maximum values at around 180 ppm to in, um, uh, for uh, about 30 ppm was the CO2 rise at that time during the what we call the Heinrich Stadial one. Um, and I'm using carbon isotopes in a model simulation to make some um, statements about what may have happened in the past. Um, in fact, uh, maybe before I should continue, I, I, I should acknowledge my co-author, David Lund, who has contributed to the data synthesis um, and also support by um, NSF's Marine Geology and Geophysics program for this. And, and if, you, if you are looking for more information, um, this is a, currently a paper available at, in the Climate of the Past discussions. Um, so. We'll, we'll be talking about the early deglacial CO2 rise, and, um, um, and we're, I'm using carbon isotopes. And um, what, what I'll um, hope to convince you is that during that early deglacial, the Heinrich Stadial one time period, which was from 19,000 to 15,000 years before the present, there indeed was a large reduction in the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which I'll call AMOC in the following. And um, that, I think, is a very robust um, inference from the data I will show you. Uh, less robust is um, the an, an hypothesis that I will be uh, putting forward here, that this, in fact, this reduction in the AMOC has also triggered this early deglacial CO2 rise. So here's um, um, a, a figure from, from a, a paper I think this is by Denton et al. Um, but there was a, um, uh, also another, a paper by Anderson. Uh, and uh, the, these are um, paleo records from this last uh, deglaciation. And so the time now goes from right to left. And the LGM is on the right. And here is the Heinrich Stadial 1, so this uh, broad yellow bar. And here you can see the CO2 rise during that Heinrich Stadial 1, which was about 30 or 40 ppm during a, a time period of about 3,000 years or so. Um, and during the same time, uh, Antarctica was warming, whereas the north, here's uh, Greenland isotopes, are, uh, indicate cold, tem cold temperatures in the north. Um, and there's... Uh, also some evidence from the deep ocean, here's a productinium thorium record from McManus that is well cited, that indicates that the ocean circulation was reduced during Heinrich event one. But um, I, and this idea that the ocean circulation was reduced during Heinrich event one is, has been around for a long time. Um, but I was always a little bit uneasy because there were not really high resolution uh, evidence from the deep ocean supporting that. There was a lot of evidence, uh, indirect evidence from the surface, I think, supporting it, such as the uh, bipolar seesaw, so warming in the south and cooling in the north, this pattern of interhemispheric temperature changes or shifts in the ITZZ that um, show precipitation changes that are consistent with model simulations of an AMOC reduction. But evidence from the deep ocean really was lacking, in my opinion, except for some few isolated uh, records such as this one here. And there's also some controversy on this record, so it's not really clear if this is, if you can quantify AMOC changes from just a few of these productinium thori thorium records. 
So one issue I'm addressing here is really was the AMOG reduced during Heinrich's stadial one and if yes, how much? And then how is that related to this early deglacial CO2 rise? Um, just to uh, put up this quote here, I think this is from Anderson. Um, that the, the, so those authors, and also as Jochen Schmidt earlier mentioned, um, they also uh, suggest southern hemisphere processes, in this case shifts in the southern hemisphere winds being responsible for the CO2 release. But I will present a different hypothesis for this early CO, the early deglacial CO2 release. So we're using a carbon isotope model, carbon biogeochemical bio model that includes isotope cycling both in the ocean and in the terrest uh, terrestrial carbon cycle and exchange with the atmosphere. So atmospheric CO2 and C13 is fully prognostic and we include fractionation, difference, uh, different between C4 and C3 plants, air-sea gas exchange fractionation and then fractionation during photosynthesis uh, uptake um, um, of nutrients and carbon f uh, inorganic into the phytoplankton. There's some uh, simple ecosystem um, phytoplankton uh, functional type model, and then there's sinking of uh, detritus and calcium carbonate into the deep ocean. This model has been uh, described here in the 2013 biogeochemistry uh, um, uh, paper, and it has been well validated. We've compared this extensively with observations. I, I have convinced myself that this model is consistent with the modern distribution of C13 in the ocean, for example. Um, it has a very simple atmospheric model, which is a, just a one-layer, two-dimensional uh, energy moisture bal balance model, and that allows us very long-term millennial timescale simulations. Uh, one thing is important that I note here, all the, simulation, all the simulations, the results that I'm showing you today from the model, use fixed prescribed modern winds. So there are no changes in winds, okay? Uh, and the ocean circulation is a reasonably uh, uh, good uh, three-dimensional uh, general circulation model, and it includes dynamic thermodynamic sea ice. All right. Uh, the land carbon isotopes have not been published before, so I, I just uh, briefly uh, show this to say that uh, it essentially the, the C13 distribution in the model on land reflects this, uh, differ, the, the regions where C4 versus C3 plants occur. Um, so that is not very exciting, but just uh, I think this is consistent with other estimates of land carbon C13 distributions. But now, um, what, what I've been doing in the model, and this is how it started, I just was interested uh, how does changes in ocean circulation, such as large changes in the AMOC, how does those changes affect the carbon isotopic um, distributions within the uh, Earth system, within the ocean, but also with, between the ocean, land, and atmosphere? So uh, in order to uh, investigate that, I, uh, hose, uh, I put fresh water in the North Atlantic. That essentially uh, um, d reduces the AMOC. And then I wanted to study the effects of this on the carbon isotopic distributions. Uh, an important um, point to note here is that all my simulations I'm going to show you today start from pre-industrial conditions. Um, um, but I think, nevertheless, it is useful and interesting to compare them to the early deglacial uh, time of the Heinrich Stadial I from 19 to 15,000 years before the present. But please keep in mind that I'm starting from pre-industrial conditions and not, it's so these are not realistic simulations starting from realistic LGM conditions. And we know that the LGM ocean circulation and carbon isotope distributions were different than they are today. All right, so here are some results. Uh, here's the model. Time uh, goes from left to right. Uh, so I run the model for 3,000 some years. And uh, here these show, um, these lines are different model simulations with different amounts of freshwater hosing from 0 0.05 sverdrop, the, the dark blue, uh, to 0 0.2 sverdrop, the light blue line. And um, so the more freshwater you put in the North Atlantic here, I'm only putting freshwater for 400 years, um, the, the stronger the effect on the AMOC, and you can see the uh, overturning circulation reduces in these two cases, the red and the yellow, and sorry, the red and the light blue uh, cases, which have the higher forcings, and it only reduces temporally in, the, in those lower uh, forcing cases, and then returns to uh, initial values pretty quickly. But in those two cases, the, um, the AMO uh, essentially collapses, and it stays in this off state for uh, several thousand years. Now, here's the response of CO2 
uh, in the model. Uh, CO2, and I should start uh, say again, here's the model scale on the left, starting from 280 pre-industrial values, whereas I compare it to the observations here from the, from the Marquardt paper, uh, on this scale, uh, starting from last glacial maximum values from around 190 ppm. Now you can see in the case where the AMOC collapses, CO2 increases by about uh, 30 ppm or so, um, consistent um, with this increase uh, seen in the, at least consistent with this large, the, the long-term uh, increase, this multi-millennial timescale increase in the observations. Um, down here is the C13 in the atmosphere, the solid lines um, again, are the, are the atmosphere and the dashed lines are the surface ocean. So the, in the model, this, the atmospheric decrease in uh, C13 is driven by the surface ocean decrease. Um, and you can see the, the solid lines, the solid black lines here are the observations from Jochen Schmidt's um, data measurements uh, with the error bars included as the thin lines. You can see that also this, in this decrease of C13 by about 0.3 per mil um, and the rate of in decrease is consistent with the um, observations. Now here are some um, uh, distributions of C13 in the uh, modern, in the control simulation, what I call here year zero, and just showing you the uh, distribution in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Pacific as a function of latitude here on the um, horizontal axis and, and depth in the vertical axis. Um, where you can see high values are in orange and red uh, are in the in the surface and in the North Atlantic uh, deep, deep water because they're sinking that brings this high values from the surface down and then the, uh, North Atlantic deep water advects those high values towards the south and during that time period there's uh, accumulation of light um, respired carbon which reduces the, uh, the, con the values of the carbon isotopes and when you go into the Indian and Pacific Oceans, you have much lower values due to this um, uh, ongoing accumulation of uh, respired light um, C13. So there's this large interbasin gradient between the Atlantic and the Pacific in, in, in the current model. And also this is consistent with modern observations, as I've shown in this paper. And now l let's look at the case where I reduce the overturning in the Atlantic. And maybe not surprising because this, um, this great interbasin gradient is, is generated by the interbasin uh, meridional overturning circulation. So if you, re if you stop that circulation, you, you also make the C13 distributions more similar between the Pacific and the Atlantic. So in the Atlantic, um, there's a reduction in C13, and in the Pacific, there's a slight increase. Um, so. Um, if we, we can now take the difference between the two, so this now this is at year 2500 in the model. If, we, if I take the difference between the two, oops, sorry. This is shown down here in this lower panel. We can see a large decrease, and the scale is here now. It's different than the top scale. Um, the scale, so the dark blue colors are about a one per mil decrease. And C13, so you can see these large decreases in the int uh, intermediate depth in the North Atlantic, the largest amplitude decreases of more than one per mil. And then this amplitude decreases as you go further south and deeper in the water column. And in the South Atlantic, you can see it increases in C13. Also, in the deep Indian Ocean and in the deep Pacific Ocean, increases in uh, delta C13, whereas the sur surface decreases. And um, the, um, we have um, tr tried to synthesize some um, um, observations that were readily available from existing databases, and those locations are shown here as these symbols. And I'm going to show you um, in just a couple of minutes uh, these observations. Uh, so right, here are the observations, so lots of time series, and I've looked at them all in detail. I don't um, want you to look at them all in detail, so I'm trying to facilitate the comparison here by just noticing, uh, uh, looking at this LGM interval here, and then Heinrich Stadial 1, which is an average from around uh, 16,000 to 1,000 year time window uh, centered on 16K, and the LGM, I am using a 1,000 year time window centered on 19K. So there's data from the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and then a few, not so many data from the Indian and Pacific Oceans. 
Um, and I'm going to now show differences between the Heinrich Stadial 1 and the LGM. Uh, here, the top panel is the reconstructions in the data. So those are all high resolution uh, records. And here's the scale. So blue is decreases in C13, red is and yellow is increases. What you can see in the reconstructions is uh, larger decreases in the North Atlantic and less decrease, and they, they are um, um, they, they are particularly large at intermediate depth, and the amplitude decreases down in the water column and further south. And there are some increases at intermediate depth in the Indian and Pacific Oceans and also in the South Atlantic. Here is the model now sampled on the locations of the observations. You can see a very similar pattern to the observations, but you also already notice the model overestimates the amplitude here in the North Atlantic. Now, if we plot all these data in a cross plot, here is model re uh, changes in C13 versus the observations on the horizontal axis, and the red uh, crosses are the uh, high resolution data that I showed you before. Um, the, the blue uh, crosses, the blue uh, axes are uh, previous uh, compilation by, by Sarntine, but this presumably includes uh, lower resolution data. Um, so, but what you can see is that, first of all, there's a high, very high correlation of about 0.9. And, um, but there's an offset um, from these, in these data in the North Atlantic where the model predicts uh, too large an amplitude of a decrease. But nevertheless, I think it's very important that, you know, th there's a very high correlation between the model uh, um, changes and the observations. So I think this is convincing uh, proof from a distributed data in the deep ocean that indeed there was a large reduction in the AMOC um, during Heinrich Stadial 1. So to summarize, the AMOC was reduced, um, sorry, uh, the, the first point is here, the, that the AMOC reduction in the model increases CO2 in the atmosphere and decreases atmospheric C13 and those changes, uh, both amplitude and rate of change are consistent with the ice core observations. Um, in the model, the AMOC reduction decreases C13 in the North Atlantic and the surface ocean and increases C13 elsewhere in the ocean. Um, and these also are consistent with the deep ocean reconstructions that I showed you. But uh, it's notable that the amplitude in the model is overestimated in the North Atlantic. Now, what I'm concluding from this is that the AMOC was substantially reduced during Heinrich Stadial 1. Um, but because we have this overestimation of the amplitude in the North Atlantic, I cannot say that the AMOC was completely shut down as it ha happened in the model. So one explanation for the model data mismatch for the overestimation would be that the AMOC was not completely re uh, shut down or that the reduction was smaller. For example, if you would start from, uh, from uh, <clears throat> weaker initial LGM conditions. Then in the model, the AMOC uh, reduces the efficiency of the biological pump and this causes the CO2 to increase. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's no wind changes applied to the model, so we do not need any changes to the Southern Ocean directly, directly forced in the Southern Ocean, such as by wind or sea ice, to explain this early deglacial CO2 rise. And um, I think I already mentioned this is idealized experiments, no orbital and other forcings are considered, and the different initial conditions um, is a caveat that we need to consider in the interpretation. But nevertheless, I think there is a big promise here uh, for the future that more realistic simulations are possible. We can deal with these. We can make the, these uh, simulations more realistic. And um, I think it may also lead to quantification of the AMOC changes in the past and hopefully to a better understanding of deglacial atmospheric CO2. Thank you very much. Quick question, and then we're going to move on. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, so uh, the subsurface Atlantic DC, uh, del C-13 declined, uh, presumably due to greater residence time, a better expression of respiration. Why didn't right. that also happen in the Pacific? Well, the Pacific, um, oh, it's gone already. Well, the Pacific is, um, is already, uh, Less is, is already um, includes uh, lots of respired carbon. It's already very low in C13. So there, the stratification does not change much. 
Um, no, I'm forcing only the model. I'm forcing the model only in the North Atlantic. So there's where the stratification changes a lot. Um, and in the, in fact, in the model in the North Pacific, stratification decreases somewhat. So uh, you get an, an increase in C13 in the model. But there's no data so far. We, so we cannot say if the model is right or wrong there. <laughs>